My dear Bagginses and Buffins. By the blood of our people, by your lands, Chip Sick, I see in your eyes the main fear that will take the heart of me. So do you know what to see such time? Welcome back, everyone. Today, we are talking about Rings of Power, Season 1, Episode 6, Udon Revisited. Now, it's just me for today and for the rest of the episodes leading up to Season 2. We'll get back to the Two Kings once that starts up again. I wanted to just quickly touch on a few things I found of interest when I watched this episode back in preparation for Season 2. Now, this episode is basically just a large battle. I found it interesting that it comes in episode 6 and not number 7. We've really seen this rise of the penultimate episode of a season. Game of Thrones really brought this to the forefront. And that's typically where you see uh, this large-scale battle, something big happening that changes your view of the whole season up until this point normally that comes in the second last episode and then you kind of round it all off with a finale that maybe has one or two more cliffhanger drops as well as setting the stages for what's to come and starting to build that expectation for the future and this episode it's i think it's okay it's not better or worse on the second watch um the the action is not quite where it needs to be for it to be better on a rewatch the way that the lord of the rings trilogy is i know we always joke saying we'd like to go back and be able to watch them again because that first time is magical but on the rewatch you get more stuff as well so i'd almost like to be able to rewatch after watching for a first time the original trilogy and then getting to experience all the intricacies and the details that you miss on that first watch on the second and third and so forth so yeah th this one is a, a massive battle that we have been uh, building up towards and the, the action it's fine there's moments where it's great and they do play into this idea of of elves being otherworldly in the way Legolas was subtly so. Um, for example, in the original trilogy, you can see Legolas when they're going to be climbing over the mountain instead of going through Moria. And they're all getting caved in by snow. Legolas is standing on top of the snow. It's a fun little detail from the books that they threw into the movie. And you can barely see it, but it just shows like. Like these elves have this this light footedness to their character. There's an agility aspect that's unparalleled by any other mortal uh, in the in the world, and we kind of see that here with Galadriel. We've already seen it in the past, but we see it here again. Just the way she handles combat is a lot more elegant, and there's there's an unknown factor when you're if you were an orc facing her how you're going to handle it when she starts le leaning off the horse and that kind of stuff. It, it wasn't the greatest. I, I, I agree with some of the comments. It, it's not terrible, though. It can be better, and hopefully Season 2 gets it right, and I have a lot of reason to believe it will. Uh, that being said, uh, I did want to just sort of touch on some of the strange stuff in this episode that on second viewing doesn't quite work so I, I, on face on the surface of it it's just an okay episode and it doesn't get worse or better it gets stranger though for me and it, and it just reinforces my criticism of the show being the dialogue as well as the the overall structure of the story that they're trying to build in this at least in this first season and, and i hope they change going forward uh, this whole this whole mystery about who Sauron is, uh, they really play that up in this episode. Like this episode is supposed to be, did we just capture Sauron type of thing? And 
they they make it so obvious that it's not and i just what was the point of it all i i i getting aside from the dialogue which i will get to but they pitched this to the audience to us the viewers as the first season similar to game of thrones which was a mystery about you know who's kill who's been killing who, who killed the hand of the king and who's trying to kill robert baratheon like ned has to put aside his his leisurely life i guess and go to the capital and try to figure out what's going on and that works really well as this pseudo medieval mystery well cool medieval you know politicking and um fun societal tropes are are being played up we don't really get that here right we get Galadriel not being what we expect and then we have this mystery of Sauron could be one of initially four people uh, and then it's and then we, we kind of push away that cult uh, the, the cult of Sauron that is looking for him they, they're not Sauron they're looking for Sauron so we push that away but we still have Adar, the the wizard or the meteor man, as we were t calling him back then. And then you have Halbrand, and it's weird because like, why the, the other two are such powerful figures, and we're not really sure who they are. And Halbrand, we're starting to get to know, and he's just some guy. That has like exceptional skills and, and all this stuff. So I just. It's weird how they chose to make this mystery. They, they, they almost couldn't figure out ways to make clues properly without making it too obvious. And so they ended up just kind of saying it the whole time. And here we, we basically get it. Um, I. Okay, so like that's my whole issue with the the structure of this season being a mystery and not not paying that off properly. Like it it, it makes it all pointless and makes people ask why did I watch that? And if that happens, you're you're doomed as a show. So that was the first big problem at the at the end of this season. And so rewatching that's still a problem. The dialogue in this episode, I've, I've said I've liked some of the dialogue on a second watch. I Not for this episode. When In this episode, there is a lot of battle, so not a ton of dialogue. But then we get some kind of clunky dialogue between um, Elendil and Isildur. We get clunky dialogue between Galadriel and the both of them. We get, we get clunky dialogue between Galadriel and and Adar and Halbrand and Adar uh, there's the only good moment is and it's not even a good moment plot wise the only good uh, moment from dialogue in that entire encounter is when um, Halbrand is asking Adar if you if he recognizes him but the rest of it is just so weird and it they haven't properly set up the turn for Halbrand or Galadriel to be pulling each other back from the brink of of evil or I'm trying to think of a of darkness where like like Galadriel hasn't proven to the audience that she's capable of it and so to have her do that to Halbrand and say no this isn't you like it just doesn't feel earned and I think I said this in the in our first watch that it it just feels like they want they, they just needed a way to make Halbrand seem unhinged and then have someone pull him back and Galadriel is the one to do that I think that's a mistake I think Elendil or the Queen Regent or a Sealdor or somebody should have been there 
to be making that that statement instead of Galadriel. And then again, I think maybe okay, maybe you can argue after Halbrand is pulled back from the brink of someone other than Galadriel, then he pulls her back from the brink, which would be really funny in hindsight because he's Sauron. So for him to pull back Galadriel from killing Adar kind of weird and and this is another problem with the story structure is in hindsight when you put all these episodes together you really do see the issues with Sauron's plan if he had one or just like why he did things in the moment that he would have had to have known how everything would turn out like he would have had to know no basically upon first sight of Galadriel in the water, because remember, that's where they meet, in the water. Galadriel is swimming back after disobeying her king and not returning to the Undying Lands, jumps off the boat. Halbrand sees her in the water with a, a couple other people who were in a shipwreck, and they rescue her, only for all of them to be killed by a, a giant shark monster thing. And then it's just her, just Galadriel and Halbrand. That's how they meet. He would have had to have known, I need to protect this female elf because eventually she will be able to introduce me to the rest of the elves and I'll get into the elven kingdom of Linden and I'll be able to corrupt it from within. He ends up getting to Numenor and doesn't really try to corrupt it all that much. Like, he doesn't really do anything. He has a brief encounter with some some men there, but it, he doesn't really... He doesn't really have any devious plans cooking. Like, there, be, because they couldn't show us this, because then it would be too obvious, because they were trying to do a mystery, they didn't allow Sauron to start corrupting people and we, we see how it would work in the prison scene. I'm, I'm, I'm now jumping back, but we see how it would work in the prison scene. When Galadriel's in prison and the guards come to get her, she like breaks out in a, in a bad action scene. But she breaks out. And then Halbrand, uh, Halbrand is there whispering in the ear of Farazan, telling him how, how best to apprehend Gal Galadriel because you can't just fight her. You're going to have to figure out what she wants, where she's going, and you know, get a step ahead of her, that kind of thing. We see how that could have worked out there, but it, they didn't do that. And so yeah, now we just, we see this moment where Halbrand could kill Adar. Doesn't, because Gladriel pulls him back. Even though he, the, the thought would be Gladriel believes he's the king of these lands who was, who was forced out by these orcs and he has every right to want to kill their leader and take back control so even if he did that in the moment it's not like Galadriel would hate him all of a sudden or something like that she would maybe think less of him for a bit um, but she's an elf she already does that so I don't really get why he didn't kill Adar there and maybe he wanted to know more about what was going on so then he stops Galadriel from killing Adar later and I don't know, it's just like Galadriel, he would have had to if he didn't want to kill him, he'd have to know Galadriel will stop him and then all of a sudden Galadriel's turning so he has to then go in and stop her and it's just kind of a mess like they didn't think through the continuity and the consistency of of what each character wants and that's ultimately what is the downfall for a lot of people of this show outside of the lore problems but in terms of the writing obviously we've got the dialogue but it's also this kind of inconsistent character motivation but I, I digress so we, we basically have a ba battle and then this interrogation scene and uh, yeah I, I I mean you get the big the big explosion at the end and that 
that does set up some cool, interesting, interesting stuff going forward. And obviously, we're watching it in hindsight. Uh, this this does feel that this does feel like we are building towards a like getting a, a chance to see uh, a sort of an orc society in the future. Um, but other than that, like it's a cool shot. Other than that, it's kind of a weird like. It, this is Star Wars has this problem. I wish my my fellow king was here to, to to dissect that with me. But Star Wars has this problem where like these MacGuffins that they use, like this sword here. It like who designed this magic sword volcano trick? And what was that process like? Because you start thinking about this and it just doesn't seem to work. It doesn't make sense. When you look back at the original trilogy. There are these moments, but it all makes sense. You can actually see why these things would come about. That's fine. If if you can easily put together, it, not even easily, even if it has to be difficult to put together a, a, a reason for why things the, are the way they are, that's fine. But in this case, it's kind of insane. Similar to the, the latest trilogy in Star Wars where they've got this dagger that is designed for if you stand on this very spot on this cliffside and look at at this crashed spaceship it'll point exactly in the spaceship where to find this like magic waystone or something like that and that takes you to the magical sith planet where they've built a bunch of other spaceship like like that kind of stuff normally people can look past crazy little things that's huge that's the whole thing without those things happening there is no story and in the same way here without this sword being this crazy magical artifact that isn't actually a sword at all even though it kind of looks like it it's more it, it belongs to this weird statue magic thing that can make the volcano erupt and it just there might be an explanation for it just the way they've designed it makes it really tough to find one and justify all of this. Um, what, like it, yeah, it, it's just, it's a weird way. Like they clearly thought the sword looked cool and that's why they used that. And then they, they ultimately wanted something to cause this, this volcano erupting. Um, but you don't need the sword to do it. You, there could just simply be uh, a spell or a small item that makes more sense than than the sword. I, I don't know. It's just there's there's better ways to do it than having this broken sword that that jabs into your arm, which I get. It's drawing blood, it's, but like the design is even kind of silly because most of the time when you need to do like a, some sort of blood oath thing in magic, you cut your hand with like a dagger. That would make more sense here, actually. Like, you know, a a ring or an eye or something small that would be a little bit more in keeping with what this is, which is just a, a magic spell to reignite this volcano. Uh, but that's it for this one. Let me know what you guys thought down below, and I will see you on the next one.